Praise us greatly for the time and attention that we give to Him that is His due. And so let us pray. Let us remind ourselves that we are always in the presence of God, our Father, everywhere. That God is with us at all times, but especially when we are gathered in the name of His Son, Jesus, who is here present in our midst. And so we pray, grant us, Lord, our God, the constant gladness of being devoted to you, for it is full and lasting happiness to serve with constancy the author of all that is good. And as we contemplate your word today, we call to mind the many times in our lives that we felt like giving up that we have felt like our world had ended or that our world was ending. And we ask you to remind us constantly of the power of the resurrection in our lives, that in spite of anything and everything that may come our way, that the resurrection always awaits, that no matter how many Good Fridays we may go through, Easter always is around the corner as we pray today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so, as we are nearing Advent, which is the beginning of the church's calendar you know the church operates on a different calendar than the secular world so our year begins with the first sunday of advent and continues and the church's calendar year is meant to enhance our walk with the lord and as we are nearing the celebration of advent these readings that we are looking at, particularly this coming weekend's readings, have to do with the end times. And we hear that so much, the whole idea that the world is going to end. People keep thumping that away all the time. The world is going to end. Prepare yourself. The world's going to end. Look at all the things that are happening all around you. And they'll take quotations from the Bible and they'll show you. See, all that's happening, the end of the world is coming. You better prepare yourself. Store up things. And people do all sorts of things thinking that the world is going to end like this or imminently and as we will hear in the readings today the end of the world is not as clear of an idea as we may think it is the end of the world is not just the concept that the world will end when Jesus comes back again but the end of the world is something that happens on a daily basis for so many of us and so as we look at these readings let's have an open mind and remember the Bible is constant in letting us know do not be afraid Fear is something from the devil. The devil wants you to be afraid, to fear. If you are with the Lord, you have nothing to fear, but fear itself. Nothing to fear, but fear itself. So we are not to be afraid, but we are to always be reminded constantly of the presence of God in our lives and that it's all going to be fine, no matter what happens. 
And so let's look at the first reading from the prophet Daniel. In those days, I, Daniel, heard this word of the Lord. At that time there shall arise Michael, the great prince, guardian of your people. It shall be a time unsurpassed in distress. Since nations began until that time, at that time your people shall escape, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some shall live forever, others shall be in everlasting horror and disgrace. But the wise shall shine brightly like the splendor of the firmament, and those who lead the many to justice shall be like the stars forever. The word of the Lord. The writers of the Bible foretell the end of the world. In biblical terms, we call this the apocalypse. And there is a pattern that happens whenever the end of the world is foretold to us in the Bible. First, we have presented to us a selected series of historical events up to the moment of writing. Then we are told of future historical events many times in very vague terms, which is why so many people today can exploit the Bible to prove their own point. Just because somebody can quote the Bible for you doesn't mean they are worthy of you paying any attention to them, because even the devil can quote the Bible to prove his own point. That's why we have so many Christian denominations, and they... One denomination after another keeps opening up. One church keeps opening after another. People get up in the morning and say they have a revelation and they're going to found a church. Even the devil can quote the Bible to prove his own point. So just because somebody's quoting the Bible doesn't mean they are worthy of you paying attention to them. You have to be very careful. Very careful. But even though the Bible is presenting to us these times of distress, as we have just heard from the prophet Daniel, that there are times of distress in the past, there were times of distress, there are times of distress today, distress means trouble, suffering, problems, there were times of distress in the past, there are times of distress today, but always the Bible presents to us the idea that the end comes and the end comes with the resurrection which is the center of everything we await, the resurrection. So many people think that Christmas is the most important celebration in the time of the church's calendar, that it's Christmas. Jesus could have been born, but if he had not resurrected from the dead, if he hadn't risen from the dead, everything we do would be not, would be nothing. It's the resurrection that we are about. We are a resurrection people, a people of the resurrection, and Alleluia is our song. Alleluia is happiness, joy. We sing Alleluia. We go through life going through all sorts of distress, but we have Alleluia on our lips, for we know that resurrection comes. The resurrection comes. And this is the point that the Bible is trying to make, that despite that which happened or will happen, resurrection always follows. So our present passage follows this precise pattern. There's trouble or temptation that is always part of our life. Always. So the fact that there are signs today that the world is coming to an end, there were signs yesterday. There were signs a century ago. There were signs in the beginning when Jesus resurrected. That's why the early Christians thought Jesus was going to come back right away. That his coming was imminent. They stopped working because they thought Jesus was coming. There were times they saw signs 2,000 years ago, 
as there are signs today, and there will always be signs. Temptation or trouble is always present in our life. That's when we pray the Our Father, when we say, lead us not into temptation, meaning, Lord, keep trouble away from us. The idea of temptation is what the devil brings into our life. And temptation is trouble. There's trouble always in our life. Keep us away from temptation. Steer, steer the trouble away from us, O Lord. But the deliverance that follows any experience of temptation and trouble in our life is the point. That there is always deliverance. Always. And that deliverance is the resurrection. And so, as the Psalms proclaim, especially Psalm 91, Be with me, Lord, when I am in trouble. That's the point. Be with me, Lord, when I am in trouble. That's why when you come to Mass, the phrase most often repeated is what? The Lord be with you. And so many people, you know, they respond very mechanically, right? When the priest says, the Lord be with you, everybody says, and with your spirit, right? So the Lord be with you. The whole idea that God is with us, that's the point. God is with us in the midst of our trouble. And that should be enough. Some, sometimes when we come to Mass, we say, oh, there they go again. You know, they go through all this ritual, all the... the the Lord be with you and people, and also with you. Well, they used to say, and also with you. Remember when we used to say before Advent of 2011, it was an also with you? I became a priest in 2010. So at that time, there, it was still when the priest would come up to the ambo to proclaim the gospel, the priest would still say, the Lord be with you. And the people would respond, not like today, and with your spirit, they would respond, and also with you. And this happened to me once, right after I was ordained a priest. I didn't know quite how things worked at the ambo, you know, where when you read the gospel. And so I went up all nervous, and the microphone was not working. And so I tapped the microphone, I tapped it, and I said, there's something wrong with this. And all the people answered, and also with you. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something, if we think about this, there's something wrong with all of us. Each of us has something wrong with us. It's part of, part of human nature. And of course, we had a good laugh because everybody was just responding mechanically, right? And the reason, then the reason for that is because so many times when we go to Mass or when we read the Bible, we don't really think about it. We're not thinking about what it is that we're hearing. And the phrase that is most often repeated at Mass, if you think about it, is the Lord be with you. And the Lord is with us. The church in her great wisdom, 2,000 years of wisdom that we celebrate every time we gather for Mass. It's 2,000 years of wisdom that is there compiled for us, coming from the great tradition of our forefathers, our fathers in faith, the heritage that we have from the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, that is there contained in all that the church brings to us, to instill in us that God is with us. So it is important to note that the resurrection is understood not as a resuscitation, resuscitation to the same mode of existence as in the present life. So uh, if you're drowned if you're drowning and then somebody gives you cpr you get resusc re resuscitated okay i can't pronounce that too well in english okay there my my english as a second language comes comes true through see those are the hard words in english english is a hard language very hard language and so the 
The idea is not that resurrection brings you back into the same mode of life. Like when you receive CPR, the life that you've had before, you're going to have it after as well. No. Resurrection is to give you a complete transformation. The experience of resurrection is a complete renewal. You're to be different. In other words, when we experience the resurrection, we are to be made into new creatures with new modes of thinking. You can experience the resurrection right now in your life by being born again, as Jesus said. Being born again. To be born again is to have a new way of seeing the world not with the eyes of the world, but with the eyes of God, the eyes of faith. In other words, God is present with me. I'm going to be okay. It will all work out. No matter the trouble that I'm going through, no matter the suffering, the tribulation that I'm going through, it's all going to work out. See, that's the, that's the whole idea of being born again. A live, living with a different mindset, different way of seeing things, with a different body. You're totally renewed. You know, our, our whole body is connected. Body and spirit, it's all connected. The Greeks believed that it didn't matter what you did with your body, which is why they led such a loose life. They had bathhouses and all sorts of things back then. And they, if you, if you think there's debauchery going on in Las Vegas, read up about the life during ancient times, all that went on in the ancient world. They didn't care. They, they believed that the person was body and spirit. The whole idea that we have a soul inside of us is not a Christian idea. It's present in the Greek philosophers from the very beginning of time. Human beings knew that they had something more inside of them. And you know that as well through your own life experience. You don't have to be told that by the Bible or by the church or by a priest that you have a soul in you. You know that. Even people who are not believers. I'm spiritual, right? Spiritual. Because we feel that as human beings that there's more to us than just our bodies. But our bodies, for us as Christians, are just as important because the health of the soul is connected to the health of the body and vice versa. The health of the soul is connected to the health of the body. This is a revolutionary concept that Jesus introduced and that Christianity introduced. Paul tells us we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. It matters what you do to your body. If you abuse your body, you are bringing death to your soul. That's why you should be exercising, eating right. Yes, eating right. If, you, if you're depressed, you got to deal with it. There's nothing wrong with going to the doctor and saying, I'm down, I feel bad. Depression is a chemical imbalance in your body. The medicine is a gift from God. If you're feeling depressed, if you have anxiety, go to the doctor, seek help for that. There's nothing wrong with that. Your soul's not going to be healthy until you take care of your body. If you constantly eat three times a day uh, at the American Embassy, you know the American Embassy. Um, McDonald's, right? Okay. If you, if you eat there three times a day, you're not going to be healthy. And when your body's unhealthy, that affects your spirit. You know that. I'm not telling you anything new. So we have to care for our body. And when that transformation comes into my life, a total transformation, not a resuscitation, 
transformation. That's resurrection. Transforming me. It turns you into a totally new person. A person who is able to see things differently. And that in turn translates into health both of the body and mind. The word, health, the word health in Latin is salus, which is where we get salvation from. Jesus didn't just come to save us from death in the life to come. Jesus came to save us from death here and now. How many people are dead here and now? living a life of death here and now, walking around like zombies. They may be able to move their limbs, but they're dead inside. You can be alive, walking around, but dead, enslaved, feeling like you want to give it all up, which is why there's so, many, so much suicide today. We've never had suicide rates as horrible as we have them today. Suicide rates are on the rise unbelievably. And so the outside testifies to the inside, which is why you should dress well. Yes, there's nothing wrong with dressing well, looking well, wearing cologne or perfume, taking a bath. <laughs> deodorant <laughs> yeah, I remember reading about the account of somebody who survived the concentration camp Auschwitz and they said and this person said that they would get up every morning and comb their hair every morning. Now, they were on their way to death, but they would get up every morning and comb their hair. And they said this was a way of proving to the Nazis that their life was important and that they couldn't suck their life out of them. That they had the will for living. When you just roll out of bed in the morning and uh, here's another day, when you get up, take the time to get ready, look nice, put makeup on, right? wear nice clothes, all great and refreshed. It's wonderful. Absolutely great. There's nothing wrong with that. Go to the gym or go for a walk, go for a run. Enjoy life, in other words. Show through your actions the health of your spirit that you're happy to be alive, that no matter the trials and tribulations, life is good. Life is worth living because life is a gift from God. It's all great. And that's what the psalm today, as we look at the psalm for November 15th, we look at what the psalmists proclaim. There's 150 psalms in the in the Bible, and they are beautiful ways of prayer. You are my inheritance, O Lord. Repeat that. You are my inheritance, O Lord. O Lord, my allotted portion and my cup, you it is who hold fast my lot. I set the Lord ever before me. With him at my right hand, I shall not be disturbed. You are mine. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body too abides in confidence because you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your faithful one to undergo corruption. You. You will show me the path to life. Fullness of joys in your presence the delights at your right hand forever. You are my inheritance, O Lord. The psalmist couldn't have said it any better today for us. 
God is our inheritance, His presence with us forever, as the psalm here proclaims. What life is like after the resurrection can only be described in poetic terms, which is the psalms. They're very poetic, they're songs, which is why at Mass the psalm is sung, particularly on Sunday. It means entrance into a totally transcendental mode of existence. Total transformation. This psalm expresses a devout individual's trust and hope in Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of God in the Bible, one of the names used for God. And the reason why there are no vowels there is because in Hebrew there, wouldn't, there are no vowels. So, that's why I spelled that that way there for you. And Yahweh is to deliver the writer here from Shaul and the pit. It doesn't mean resurrection from the dead like when you die, but rather deliverance at death's, at death's door. Death is the work of the devil. What brought death? The devil. The devil tempted Adam and Eve. Remember that in the beginning when God set up the world, there was no death. They lived in paradise. There was no difference between heaven and earth. And then the temptation of the devil came in. The devil tempted the first human beings. And death entered as part of our existence as human beings. And so death is the work of the devil that knocks on our door every day of our life. Death is knocking at your door every day of our life. You have to get away from this concept that the worst thing is the death at the end. Death is not just the death to our body when we pass from this life to the next. Death doesn't just visit you once during your lifetime, but every day, and sometimes multiple times a day, death comes into your life. Shaul, in the Hebrew Bible, when I say the Hebrew Bible, I'm talking about the Old Testament, is a place of darkness to which all the dead go, but the righteous and both the righteous and the unrighteous. So both the people who are living in a state of grace and the people who are not living in the state of grace. In other words, just because you are with God doesn't mean trouble escapes you. Just because you go to church doesn't mean trouble escapes you. You're not going to have suffering. Trouble comes to the life of each and every person, both those who are with God, churchgoers, and those who do not go to church. Suffering is not going to escape you because you're going to church. So regardless of the moral choices made in life, death comes to each and every human being. It is a place of stillness and darkness, cut off from life and from God. This is what St. John of the Cross calls the dark night of the soul that comes into us when we feel the absence of God in our life. It's the cry of Jesus from the cross. Remember what Jesus cried when he was on the cross? His one cry of desperation. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Where are you, God, in other words? When death comes knocking in our life, at our door, it's the same cry in our life. Where are you, God? Why have you abandoned me? Why are you, why are you not with me when I'm going through this or that? When I have this disease that I have been diagnosed with, where are you? When I'm depressed, where are you? Full of anxiety, where are you? When I can't get pregnant, where are you? 
When I've been raped, where are you? So many times when people kill your spirit, they kill your soul. It's like being raped. They suck the life out of you. And so many people experience rape on a daily basis in their life from the people in their life. When they have their very life sucked out of them. And then we say, where are you, God? Where are you? Why is this or that happening? This is the cry of Jesus and it's the cry of human beings who go through life looking at all that is happening in the world and around them. It's the existential question of why is there suffering? Why is there evil? How could God permit the Holocaust or war if God is love? Why? Why have you abandoned me? The same cry that Jesus cried in his life. It's the experience of death. But God is with us. The end of the world happens for so many people every day. We are indeed in a time of unsurpassed distress. A fifth of the world's population lives in absolute poverty. A fifth of the world's population, about three billion people, lack adequate nutrition. Every three days, more people die from malnutrition and disease than from the bombing of Hiroshima. Every year, more people die from preventable hunger than died in the Holocaust. One out of every four human beings has no access to safe drinking water. There are somewhere between one billion and two billion unemployed adults in the world. The poorer countries have 60% of the world's students and 12% of the world's total education budget. More than half of the world's adult population cannot read or write. More than half of the countries of the world have used violence against their own citizens in the form of torture, brutality, and summary executions. About four million people died in wars in the 18th century. Four million people died in the 18th century. That's the 1700s. Eight million people died in wars in the 19th century. That's the 1800s. About a hundred million people died in wars in the 20th century. A hundred million people. The war continues to rage. There will always be poor with us, as Jesus tells us. There will always be war and tribulation and trials. Always. And in the words of St. John Paul II, the present situation of the world, from the point of view of development, offers a rather negative impression. In today's world, including the world of economics, the prevailing picture is one destined to lead us more quickly towards death rather than one of concern for true development, which would lead all towards a more human life. When you read this and when you think about the picture of the world we live in, do you see for how many people the end of the world happens for them on a daily basis? When you see your child die from a bomb that just fell in Syria or in the Middle East or in an African country or in Iraq. When you have been diagnosed with a debilitating disease like cancer, doesn't your world end? When your husband cheats on you and you've been married for 40 years, doesn't your world end? 
When your husband dies or your wife dies after a long marriage, doesn't your world end? When you've been laid off of work, where you've been working for 30 years, and you're still away from retirement, or when the stock market crashed and people lost their retirements, people lost their homes. When you lose your home, doesn't your world end? Do we really need to wait for the end of the world in, liter in a literal sense to experience the end of the world? The point is, the end of the world happens for us as human beings every single day. And then we go through life in the midst of this experience of the absence of God, crying the cry of desperation, where are you, God? We go in the midst of the end of the world that we experience on a daily basis, waiting, waiting, and hoping for the coming of Christ. You see, the coming of Christ is something that can and does happen to us all the time. Christ comes all the time. When we say at Mass, Come, Lord Jesus, save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. The coming of Christ is not just something that will happen at the end of the world when it's all going to be renewed, but the coming of Christ is to happen for us all the time, through our faith, all the time. See, the world ends in all sorts of ways for us all the time as people. You know, I'm reminded of this one lady who came to see her pastor because her world had ended. Her little dog died. That was the end of the world for her. She had nobody in her life. Nobody paid attention to her. Her children wouldn't pay any attention to her. Her husband had died and all she had was her dog, her only companion, and her dog died. And she comes to her pastor and says, Father, I would like you to celebrate a funeral for my dog. She wanted a funeral for her little dog. And the priest says, well, how can we do this? You know we don't celebrate funerals for dogs. And the lady looks at him and says, Father, but I was going to leave the inheritance that I'm leaving for my dog. I was going to leave it for, for the church. The inheritance that I, I'm signing over, all, all my inheritance, over a million dollars that I'm leaving for my dog, I was going to leave it for the church. And the priest looks at her and says, Well, you should have told me your dog was Catholic. <laughs> the end of the world comes in our life in so many forms. But the hope is the coming of Christ. And so the point is, stop waiting for the world to end when the world is ending for you in so many ways right now in your life. Stop waiting for the coming of Christ at the end of the world. Start waiting for the coming of Christ in your life right now. Accepting Him right now and His gift right now. You know, I'm reminded of the story of, Colo uh, of Colonial New England. In Colonial New England, a meeting of state legislators was plunged into darkness by a sudden eclipse, during which many of those present panicked and others moved to adjourn. They didn't know what was happening, right? And so they thought the world was going to end. You know, remember many of them uh, had very puritanical, fundamentalist ideas of the Bible. You know we are uh, living in a Protestant country. 
This country is very historically anti-Catholic. From the very beginning, lots of anti-Catholicism. There was even a party set up called the Know Nothing Party. And as part of the uh, history of this country was the Ku Klux Klan that had as its motto white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. And they were not just against African Americans or people of color. They were against Catholics as well. Which is why, uh, if you read through the history of this country, Catholics couldn't run for nationwide office. We didn't have a Catholic president elected here until John F. Kennedy. And Al Smith, when he ran in 1920 for office, the governor of New York, southern states deflected because they, they thought the Pope was going to be running the, uh, the country. It's kind of interesting because, you know, if you look at the history, they were so, the Americans were so afraid of the Pope running the country. This was one of the things why they didn't, so many were against John F. Kennedy being elected. That's why he had to make a famous speech saying, you know, this is not going to be it. And today, what did we just have when Pope Francis visited? They invited the Pope to speak to Congress. I mean, you see how God turns everything around? The waiting, and God does turn everything around. But... It, Historically, this country had these very Protestant ideas of, you know, the world's going to end, which is not what we as Catholics believe. We don't have this, this fundamentalist, literal concept of reading the Bible. And so this was what happened during colonial New England. They were all panicky because of a sudden eclipse, which is something natural that happens. One of the members of uh, the state legislature said, Mr. Speaker, if it is not the end of the world and we adjourn, we shall appear to be fools. If it is the end of the world, I should choose to be found doing my duty. I move you, sir, that candles be brought. I move you, sir, that candles be brought. Rather than living with this fear in our head, the world is going to end, look at what's happening in the world, you know, you've got Russia here, Putin here, right? Uh, planes falling in Egypt, this happening here, you know, the Middle East in crisis, nuclear bombs here and there, rather than having this uh, all worried, getting all worried, bring the candle. Bring the candle. We walk in darkness. The people who've walked in darkness have seen a great light. We continue to walk in darkness, but we have to learn to walk in the darkness. And we walk in the darkness with a candle. The candle, the light, Jesus Christ, the light of our lives. He is the light of our lives. He brings light into our life in the midst of the darkness, no matter what's going on. That should be the attitude for us. And so the best way to watch for the end is to suspect that there is not just one end to the world any more than there is just one coming of Christ to look forward to. When Jesus died, his disciples believed the world had ended. Did they not? They were all depressed. They were in in the room, all depressed, all down, because Jesus died. And they, they said, this was not the way it was supposed to be. When Jerusalem fell and Nero swooped down on the young church like a mad vulture, they believed the world had ended. The emperor Nero burned himself the city of Rome and then blamed the Christians and this massive persecution started in the early church 
of Christians. That's when you have the stories of Christians being fed to the lions, being devoured by wild animals. And so for many of the early Christians, their world was ending. In a manner of speaking, the world can end any day of the week with a declaration of war, the death of a child, a grim diagnosis, and watching for Christ's coming again in power and great glory can become the only light in such times. We are to wait. What is the song that we hear the most during Advent? O come, O come, Emmanuel. We sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. You know that song. We sing it all the time. Come, Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means what? God with us. God with us. Come and fill us with your presence. So evil, death, and darkness exists in our life. The fact that the list of things that I ran through today with you that is happening in the world, the poverty, the disease, the illiteracy, evil, death, and darkness exists because God made us free. God respects our freedom. God respects and values freedom in a way that we don't. God doesn't make things easier because God can't make things easier. Otherwise, we wouldn't be human, but be robots, be machines. We are free. That's why God respects our freedom. If we want to kill each other, God lets that happen. We want to set up holocausts and burn people in gas chambers. We do that. We want to drop nuclear bombs, gas people to death with chemical weapons, shoot planes down. God respects the freedom of human beings. God respects our freedom because we are not robots. He made us free. And God went so far as to give us freedom that even He won't temper with or mess with. Because God is not in the business of control. God is not here to control us. God is here to accompany us. Hence, Emmanuel. It's not God controlling us. It's God with us. God with us. That's why God took flesh through His Son, Jesus Christ, to be with us. God has visited His people and He continues to visit us every day, bringing us new resurrection, new life. That's what we believe. And so, presence is God's mode of operation. God would rather risk than control. See, God's taking a great risk on us. All of us. Because God loves us. He gives us freedom. We are, have the ability to choose good or evil. God would rather tolerate the misuse of freedom than relate to robots. See, God is perceived as silent because He allows human freedom and ingenuity to be precisely what they are meant to be. Non-coerced, even by God. God is not a frightened parent who needs to control all the time to know at every minute what my children are doing, right? I have to have complete control of them, protect them. 
You know parents who do that to their kids actually do a disservice to them. You're not supposed to be an overprotective parent. Your children have to live. Let them live. Learn through their own mistakes. If a person doesn't fall, they never have any opportunity to pick themselves up. Unless I, don't, unless I fall down, I can't pick myself up. Your children have to fall too. It's part of life. Then they pick themselves up. It's like riding a bicycle. Yeah, you'll fall down a few times, but then... Or when you're learning to walk. You got to let go of the child to let them walk. You know, and otherwise, they're never going to learn to walk. And God has let go of us here, right? We're walking here on earth. He's with us, but He's not controlling us. He's not controlling every step you make. He's with you. And that should be enough. What more do you want? See, we're all about, we always want miracles. I, mean, I want miracles. I want this, I want that. I want a miracle. You've got the miracle already. God is with you. What more do you need? And if God is with you, it's all going to be fine. God allows evil because God respects the freedom and ingenuity of creation. And as we know from elsewhere in our faith, God can ultimately redeem whatever goes wrong. Just look at the cross. That was in the end. The resurrection came after. Seemingly, what we perceive as being evil and wrong God turns it all around. God makes all things new. This helps explain not only the question of evil, but also why life can be so distressingly complex and why we can sometimes boil over into a rage. We have been made, as Scripture assures us, as little less than God. Did you know that? That you're made little less than God? When I was about uh, six years old in this small little town in Poland, small little village in Poland, our town was getting ready to welcome the bishop. And this was a big deal. He would only come like every couple of years to do confirmations and visit our church. It was a big deal. Everybody was getting ready. The church was being decorated. And this small little group of um, older ladies who kind of ran everything and told everybody what to do, you know, <laughs> including the priest. Yeah. He was afraid of him, believe me. Because they had the power of gossip. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they would love to talk about the priest. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, in my previous town where I was a priest in Crescent City, I always liked to go shopping like uh, after 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. at night, because it was a small town, and I'd go to the Walmart. And I precisely wanted to go at around 10 o'clock because I didn't want to meet some of the people who would, you know, the gossipers, you know. And I'm walking through the Walmart and I already went and did most of my shopping and I already picked up um, a six-pack of um, Diet Coke. <laughs> Anyway, I'm walking through the aisle, and there, I said, oh no. <laughs> there she is, the worst one of them all. <laughs> no! And she sees me, and she goes straight to me, right for her, and she looks in the cart. <laughs> And she says, Does the bishop know you drink beer? 
<laughs> and I said, no, but I'm sure he will now. <laughs> And I said, and when you write to him, give him my best. <laughs> anyway, so now you have the picture of this small little town in Poland and these group of ladies that were arranging the visit of the bishop. And they said, we need to welcome the bishop with a poem and we need a kid to learn the poem and to welcome the bishop with the poem and guess who they chose <laughs> so I learned the poem and then I welcomed the bishop you know in in the church and afterward he picked me up into his arms the bishop and he says and he's got the microphone there and he says now you said this poem so well what is it that you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> and I thought for a while, and I was thinking still, and he says, do you want to be a priest? And I said, no! <laughs> <laughs> See, God has a sense of humor. <laughs> and he says, well, what is it that you want to do then? And I said, I want to be God. <laughs> and he says, God? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, why? And I said, because God doesn't die. And I don't want to die. <laughs> See, from the mouth of babes, the truth shall flow. <laughs> well, when I got home, I... <laughs> <laughs> You know, I told you, small town, big hell, right? Pueblo chico, infierno grande. So, when I got home, my grandfather, who as I told you, he never went to church. He says, I heard <laughs> that you told the bishop that you want to be God. Well, if you want to be God, we'll have to put you on the cross because, because God has to suffer. And all I thought was of this big cross that stood in front of the church and it didn't have a body on it. And I said, oh no. <laughs> They're going to place me up on that cross. And he says, so? And I said, well, I'll just settle for being a priest if I can't be God. <laughs> but anyway, this story is so poignant and illustrating to us that God, from the very beginning in the Bible, tells us that we are made in the image and likeness of God. God made us little less than God himself little less than God himself. And in Jesus Christ, we meet a God who suffers. God who suffers. And he suffers. Not for our sake, but for the sake of those. He suffers not for his own sake, but for our sake. And invites us to do the same as we endure our own daily cross that we have to bear. You are not worthy of me unless you pick up your cross and daily follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me every single day. That is why, as Paul tells us in the Bible, let me not boast, but in the cross of my Savior, Jesus Christ. The cross is our glory. We do not run away from the cross. The cross is part of our life. We can't run away from it. But we can live with the hope of the resurrection. The hope. That's our miracle. That God is with us. See, things could be simpler if God had made us like Swiss clocks. Wonderfully tuned to preset rhythms. With no mess. No sin. No evil. 
and the beauty of perfect crystal, then there wouldn't be any love then. Because love is messy. Love is imperfect. Love is not set like a clock. There wouldn't be any freedom, any creativity, or any meaning to our life. Life is complicated, in other words. And that's good, because it makes life interesting. Wouldn't life be boring otherwise? But in the midst of the com complexity of our life, we are to learn to walk with the presence of God. See, God filled us with godly fire, made us little less than Himself. In the image and likeness of God we are made. He filled us with His fire inside of us. Oh, Jesus says, how I wish the world was set on fire. Oh, and how I wish, He says, it was already blazing. You have that fire inside of you. And we are capable of both martyrdom and murder as people. And you know that. We are capable of being saints and being murderers as human beings. Christians are not the only ones made in the image and likeness of God. Every single human being is made in the image and likeness of God. Every one of us. It's a choice, in other words. Do you choose martyrdom or murder? Do I choose to give my life or do I choose to continually take life? What is my attitude in life? Do I take or do I give? Jesus gave and calls us to do the same. And I want to leave you today with a quote from our Holy Father, Pope Francis, who preached a homily on this very gospel for this coming Sunday. In his homily, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Pope Francis discusses our final destination. What does he consider the job of the church or the people of God to be while we are here on earth? How are we to live, in other words? As martyrs, what is the destination of this people? The Pope says, this is him now, Pope Francis. What is the destination of this people? Our destination is the kingdom of God. Full communion with the Lord. Familiarity with the Lord. Entry into his own divine life where we will live in the joy of his love beyond measure. A full joy. Dear brothers and sisters, being the church, the people of God, in accordance with the Father's great design of love, means to be the leaven of God in this humanity of ours. It means to proclaim and to bring God's salvation to this world of ours. So often led astray, in need of answers that give courage, hope, and new vigor for the journey. May the church be a place of God's mercy and hope where all feel welcomed, loved, forgiven, and encouraged to live according to the good life of the gospel and to make others feel welcomed, loved, forgiven, and encouraged. The church must be with doors wide open so that all may enter. And we must go out through these doors and proclaim the gospel. There's so much suffering and pain in our midst. Do not add to anyone's misery. Your job is to take away from it as a follower of Jesus. As Jesus gives, so we are to give. 
so as to receive. For it is in giving that we receive, not in taking. In giving we receive, and in dying that we hope to be born to eternal life. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together as we encounter every day the end of the world through all that comes our way. We ask for your Spirit to continually fill us with your presence, fill us with your peace, the peace that you came to give. For as you said, Peace I give you, my peace is my gift to you. Not the peace the world gives, but the peace that you give, O Lord, we seek in, in our hearts. Lift us up from our darkness and keep our focus always on the candle burning in the midst of the darkness, that we may always follow the candle, the light, you, Jesus Christ, our Lord, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And may the Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Next week, because of the Advent preparations, there will be no class on the 16th. So no Bible study next week. And then the following week, look on your calendars because... The class is moved, I think, to the Tuesday, so make sure you look on the calendars. Everything, the calendars are available online, as well as other resources. I will be putting some other wonderful gifts for all of you on the website. And if you go to the church's website, click on the Bible study.